Welcome to CEDH TV, where we are in this video going to make a deck tech and a game guide on Blood Pod. Blood Pod is a little bit out of the ordinary. Instead of going for a straight up combo win, it's actually trying to beat opponents down with combat damage, like a beatdown deck. However, it does have a little bit of a combo inside it. It has the Burping Pod to fetch Kikiiki and other combo cards that can be used with Kikiiki to create infinite tokens with haste and kill everyone. But actually, Bloodpot is a controlled and aggressive stack deck. And the main game plan for this deck is to put in a lot of different kinds of hate bears, creature cards, that are trying to lock down the game and prevent your opponents from winning. And then using these creature cards and attack and making Timna draw you more cards. Repeatedly going through the deck, fetching your combo card to yourself and continuously putting in more and more stacks creature cards to lock your opponents out of the game. So Tumna is a very core component as the commander for this deck. While Tana the Bloodsower is basically most there for the color identification of red and green, but well, Skull Clamp together with Tana is kinda good. But in the overall, it is actually a little bit of a toolbox deck, because the deck is using Birthing Pod and other cards that does the same thing, search a library for a creature card and put it into play, and then trying to fetch the right hate bears, the right creature cards with stacks abilities for the right scenario versus the right opponents. And that is a little bit tricky. You need to figure out what is going to be the best creature card to have in play to prevent the opponents from winning. So this deck is definitely not a deck you're piloting on autopilot. But that is basically the philosophy of the deck and the basic structure of the game plan. Using Tana and Timna to gain the color identification you need, skipping blue, and then having Timna as a card drawing outlet, and then using sort of toolboxing search capabilities of fetching specific creature cards that you need for the right scenario, and then having the Kiki Yiki combo together with whatever creature that will untap him. But because there are so many CDH decks that doesn't rely on creatures, that actually has no creatures in play whatsoever, this strategy kinda works really good. However, if you're up against a lot of more creature-orientated CDH decks, this deck will probably have a little bit harder getting through, because it, the deck needs to actually hit your opponent's face to make Timna draw your cards. However, it is actually working quite good, because usually there's always going to be one or two opponents that doesn't have creatures to block with at all. And that creates the possibility for this deck to actually go to a beatdown. Like I talked about earlier, you don't need to focus on your combo, it could be uh, something you go for when the right situation applies to it, but usually you're just grinding your opponents out of the game. But that means that you can build your blood pot deck in a lot of different variations of ways. And in my opinion, there isn't a the right blood pot deck out there, the correct one. You should build your blood pot deck according to the metagame of your playgroup, according to what you're usually up against. That will make the deck more focused to what it's going to kill. Here we have Kes, Dissident Mage, a spellslinger deck that is filling up the graveyard and storming off. And here we have Idris the Maelstrom Wanderer, also a storm deck. So both of these two decks are trying to win with storm count, trying to build up a huge life total with 80 flux reservoir and then killing everyone by paying 5th life and shooting player by player. That is actually a common thing to do with these two commanders. And 80 flux reservoir basically created the possibility of playing storm in CEDH. It was possible before, but it was a little bit harder, almost impossible, but well, it's there. In any case, now, how can Blood Pod stop this? An obvious choice would be something like Mulrod and Stony Silence, because that makes it impossible to activate Aether Flux Reservoir. You can still gain the life, it's a trigger to gain the life, but it's an activated requirement to shoot 50 damage and paying 50 life. And with these two enchantments and artifacts in play, that is impossible. However, I'm going to say that these two commanders are so good at storming off and going through the entire deck that once they are going to do this, they are still going to climb that storm count really high and then finding ways to remove these two permanents. That means that, sure, they are lying there sitting in play, denying them the mana stones that they can use, but they are not denying them the dark rituals or the other red rituals that give them a lot of mana. And eventually they are just going to use maybe a Cyclonic Rift or a Chaos Warp to remove these two stacks pieces and then going through and then killing everyone anyways. So these two actually cards aren't that great, preventing the combo. 
However, rule of law or a dialogue of Relitic, each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. This is really going to wreck them. This is going to make them almost impossible to start building. However, they can also get through this by removing the Edalion. That is possible, it's going to happen eventually, so you need a little bit more stacks pieces on the board, but this is going to be an impossible wall for them to go over, because they're never going to build a storm count higher than one. But now, both of these two commanders are spell slingers. They are trying to cast a lot of cheap instants and sorceries to just go through more card draw and more mana. And then a card like Twin's Fair, that is making everything that costs less than 3 cost 3. So a dark ritual, 1 black mana gain 3 black mana becomes 3 mana gain 3 mana. Pretty useless, it just shuts the card completely down. The same with Sphere of Resistance, making everything also cost more mana, making it really hard to climb the storm count ladder. But there are more cards that are actually quite good versus these commanders, actually only good versus Kes. This is only for Kes. So Kes is a commander that plays cards from the graveyard. Well, Maelstrom usually does that too, but Kes a little bit more focused. Kes usually wants to wheel a fortune, put a lot of cards in graveyard, maybe Jogmoth's will, then use Kes, or maybe another card that may make her able to cast Jogmoth's will from the graveyard and then just use everything she has from the graveyard and win. And having a card like Deathrite Shaman or Dryad Militant makes it really difficult for Kes to build her graveyard. Now, the Blood Pot deck really can't play on the fly, because look around here. Red and green, white and black, no blue. And let's just read on the birthing pot. Activate this ability only any time you could cast a sorcery. That means you can't activate the birthing pot in instant speed on one of your opponents. That means that you can't make Dry and Militant or Phyrexian Revoker enter the battlefield in instant speed. That means that you need to plan ahead. And that means you need to know about your opponents. You need to know your opponent's deck. And that is why we're going through it like this. Now, here are two mono blue commanders that are using artifacts to win the game. Teferi Temporal Archmace is using the Shane Whale, while Baral Shifa Compliance usually go for Sensei's Divining Top. Now, in super super short, this is the usual way and the most common way these two commanders win. They are a little bit more cards they need for the combo, but we're not gonna touch that right now. We're just gonna focus on the core pieces, and that's these artifacts. And we can shut these down, like we talked about earlier, again, with Stony Silence and Null Rod, preventing artifacts from activating, making it impossible for these two commanders to win. But also take a look at that Twin Sphere is actually quite good here as well, because the combo with Sensei's Divining Top in super super short again requires that you recast this help over and over, putting it on top of your library, making a copy of this ability to draw two cards and then drawing Sensei's Divining Top. That means that you need to just pay Sensei's Divining Top cost of one over and over. But with a Twin Sphere in play, the Sensei Top basically becomes free mana, making it at least a little bit harder for the top to activate. My point with the Twin Sphere is that you should try to have cards inside your deck that are working against a lot of different opponents. For example, the Twin Sphere was good versus Kes, but it's also a tiny little bit good versus Baral, and that means that we're hitting several different opponents with our stacks pieces. And that is stacks pieces that you should look for. You don't want to focus one stacks piece versus a single opponent. You want one single stacks piece to affect several different opponents. That's a great card to use. And still staying on topic, look here. A Dylan of Heretic is also quite good because you can't loop Sensei's Divining Top. If the Dylan with the Rule of Law effect, each player can't cast more than one spell each turn, you can't recast over and over your Sensei's Divining Top, making it impossible for Baral to win. So here's a secondary stacks piece that is good, again, versus several opponents. But we don't just want to stop them at their combo level, we want to stop them before that. We want to shut them down completely, and that is why we're playing a card like Shoke. Islands don't untap during your controller's untap step. Now, we are not playing the color identity blue. That means we have no islands whatsoever, but islands are a pretty common land to play in CDH. And look, here are two mono blue commanders. Great. This is gonna hurt them. 
All right, so here we have four commanders with one thing all in common. We have Tessicle, the Golden Fan, Captain Cissé, Yisan, the Wandering Bard, and Thrasios, Triton Hero. Now, Thrasios, Triton Hero might be maybe the best commander currently inside the entire format. However, the thing all of these four commanders have together is they have all together an activated ability. And they all have a huge problem with Linvala, Keeper of Silence. Activated abilities of creature your opponent's control can't be activated. This legendary flying angel really shuts these four commanders down, especially Cisse and Yisan. But also, some good old stacks cards we talked about earlier is good once more. This Idalion is good once more. Cedisi is quite shut down by it. However, we are starting to see a difference. Yisan doesn't care one bit against the rule of law effect. Each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. Yisan doesn't cast spells at all. However, both of these two commanders that are searching the library are suffering greatly at the hands of the Barbarian's Stranglehold, but also versus the Flying Bird Person Aven Mind Sensor. Searching the library is quite important for Yisan and Cisse. Shutting that down is quite good. Actually, I wanna point something out. Every CDH deck out there are currently searching their library as much as humanly possible. Play these two cards. Do it. Just do it. While the card choke also hurt these two commanders a little bit. Now, Terrasius, Triton Hero and Tusigur aren't only blue and are going to have lands that have for blue that aren't in islands. So they're not going to die from choke, but they're going to be at least a little bit effective. You're going to at least maybe shut down one or two islands and that is okay, that is at least something. I have one more commander to show, that is Brea Ethereum Shaper. She is one interesting commander trying to achieve unlimited amount of mana, infinite mana. Because when she does, she will kill everyone. She will cast herself, sacrifice herself and one top there to deal 3 damage to target player. And that will put Brea back into your command zone. And then just repeat this because we have unlimited amount of mana until everyone is dead. Amazing. Now the two most common ways of doing this is through the graveyard. We are either going through the Bomberman combo or the World Gorgon Anime Dead combo. So what we want to do is to shut down Breya's graveyard. So here we have Scavenging Ooze. We have Ground Seal. I think Ground Seal is great. It depends a little bit on your build, because maybe Ground Seal will kill your two if you have a build that is trying to interact with target your own graveyard. However, I think Ground Seal is good. It can trips and draw a new card. We also have a Death Fight Shaman, a really strong card we've seen over and over currently. And now we have something more. Null Rod and Stony Silence in play means that Breya can't activate. She is an artifact. Huh! Now this is how I believe that you need to think in order to build your Blood Pot deck. Because you need to hit stacks cards that shut down several different commanders and usually trying to hit those that you're playing most commonly. And I also need to point out the obvious fact that because of this, this is a deck that you shouldn't go for if you're new to CEDH. It is maybe pretty much a veteran build, a veteran deck, because you do need to know about so many different variations of combo decks out there that you're going to shut down. Like I said earlier, we don't have the color blue and we can't put cards into play at instant speed, except a couple of ones we could put even mind sense into instant speed because it has flash, but still, piloting the blood pot deck is playing in preparation. You are doing things in preparation to something that you predict is going to happen. You predict that the Brave combo deck is going to gain a lot of infinite mana through the graveyard, and therefore you are trying to shut the graveyard down, trying to use your blood pod or green sun senate or whatever, or your Yisan. Yisan is usually played inside blood pod, you are trying to hit cards that are toolboxing in the right scenario versus the right opponent. I can't emphasize that enough. And in my personal experience playing stacks, I have learned that a single stacks piece isn't enough. Usually all of these four commanders are going to remove some of the stacks pieces and going to get through your wall, going to get through your blockade, because that is what Blood Pot does, putting up a blockade. However, you need to build a really thick blockade because you do need several layers of different problems for your opponents to climb over. And once your blockade is big enough, you simply go for your own combo with Kiki Iki. But I want to show you something more. This is Yadok Teague, here is a Tortillian Honor Guard and here is Hushwing Griff. Now these stacks pieces and these hate bears 
will actually shut you down. Gather fatigue will make it impossible for you to play your birthing pod. And it's the same with Hushman Griff and Kikiiki. Kikiiki requires an ETB effect to untap Kikiiki, and the Torpor Orb Hushman Griff will shut that down. However, you can still play these hate bears because if your deck is built, if your build is focused around sacrificing creatures, like using Birthing Pod to sacrifice a creature, you can use your Birthing Pod to sacrifice Hushwing Grief when you don't need it anymore. When you want to combo off, you can remove your Hushwing Grief with the Birthing Pod or any other card that does the similar thing like Birthing Pod sacrifice a creature to combo off, to go through your own blockade. It's the same with Stony Silence and Null Rod. Those cards shut you down too. That means your Birthing Pod is out. Gone. But well, you don't always need your buffing pod, Timna and Tana will eventually go through your deck and Timna will draw a lot of cards to get your combo pieces, maybe get your Kikiiki eventually anyway. Or the always included Daimonic Tutor. We have yet to find a black deck that doesn't play Daimonic Tutor. This is where things are starting to wrap itself up. The Blood Pod deck is a very really fun deck, it's a very really aggressive deck. It is a really difficult deck that requires a lot of training, a lot of veteran play. Usually you should pick up Blood Pod once you've played a lot of other CEDH deck and learned what sort of combos there are out there. Now if you wish to see a complete decklist of how my Blood Pod deck is currently built, you should go to this tapped out page where you can find in the description below of this video. But you should bear in mind that my Blood Pod deck, the decklist you're looking at, is going to be focused around the commanders that I usually play against and how I have planned to deal with them. So, in other words, the Blood Pod deck you're going to look at from my tapped out page might not be the best one for you. The best Blood Pod deck is going to be the one that you have planned out against the most common commanders, against the most common combos you are currently playing against. And if you are for some reason playing at a huge variety of different whatever, it could be anything combo, it could be anything commander, well then you need to be a little bit more shooting everything, shotgun built. But this is it for this video and everything I wanna say about it. Well, I hope you've learned something and it's time to start building our stacks deck. Let's build a huge blockade. But if you liked the video, don't forget to give a thumbs up and also maybe share it to someone else. Take care.